Our great God in heaven, we thank you for the Bible study today. We pray that as we come, you comfort those who are suffering, you strengthen them in their persecution, and we pray, Lord, that you give them the grace to see the purpose of what you allow in their lives, so that they will be better Christians in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, you touch everyone tonight and enrich our lives from the study of your word, that as we study the word, we'll be able to stand firm, steadfast, with real conviction in our hearts, and whatever may be happening around us, in our homes, in our families, in our places of work, because of our Christian conviction, you make us to stand firm, to glorify you all the days of our lives, in Jesus' name. For those who feel weak, and they feel that they cannot stand as Christians, we pray that you give them more grace. Multiply your grace in their lives. We pray for our dear sisters who may be going through some troubling times in their families because of Christianity. We pray, o Lord, that your grace will be abundantly sufficient for them. And for our brothers too, whatever may be happening, we pray, o Lord, you strengthen everyone in Jesus' name. Give us backbone for our conviction. That whatever Satan may do through his agents, every one of your children will stand true and faithful to you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome every one of you to our Bible study tonight. Uh, those who are coming for the first time, it's just what we've called it. It's a Bible study. That means a study of the Bible. And we normally go chapter to chapter, verse to verse. And we try to dig deep in a way so that we can see what the Lord has for us in his word. And the study of the word we have is not something theoretical. It's something we apply to our lives so that we can get the nutrients of the word. Because this is spiritual food, this is honey, and this is water. This is something to refresh us, and this is something to strengthen our spiritual muscles. So that as we go through life, we'll be able to stand firm and we'll be able to do what the Lord wants us to do in the strength and the grace and the power and the might of the Lord. We are presently studying first epistle of Peter and we'll be slowly moving on. We're now in chapter 3. Today we're looking at verses 18 through to 22. You'll discover in this uh, part of uh, Peter's epistle, you'll find that he's talking about Christ. And he underlines, underscores two things about Christ. He underscores the suffering of Christ on the one hand, and then the supremacy of Christ on the other hand. Look at verse 18, the beginning of the study portion. For Christ also, as one suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, made alive by the Spirit. That's talking about the suffering of Christ. As he talks about the trial, the betrayal, the crucifixion, the death. And then he eventually talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he tells us that he suffered once. It's not a continual suffering. And it's to encourage the suffering Christians in a sheer minor that it's just once in a while suffering. It's something that takes place in a moment of time. It happens now. Then it's uh, removed, and then you pass on to glory. It tells us in the concluding verse, verse 22, who is gone into heaven, and on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. It begins from the bottom of the ladder. There's a suffering, there's a valley, passing through that valley of suffering, and then it said that has a purpose. And then it tells us Christ comes into preeminence. The supremacy is now gone into heaven, and it's at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being subject unto him. The apostle reminded the Christians who were suffering that Christ also has suffered. But then his suffering ended in supremacy. To tell those Christians that their trials, their temptations, and all the troubles they are passing through will ultimately end in triumph. If you are suffering now, you're going through some painful experiences, understand, it will not continue forever. Not only that, it's going to end in triumph. But then as Christ submitted to the will of the Father, 
suffering Christians who are suffering persecution should be patient in enduring persecution for their faith. Christ was pure and holy. Because his suffering was not for his own sin, he remained just, holy, godly, and righteous. And so we then, when we suffer, it should be that we are suffering for righteousness. We should remain righteous, remain innocent, and our suffering should not uh, be a suffering for sin. We should remain steadfast in the gospel truth and in the purity of the word of God. At the end then, as he entered into glory... So then, those of us who suffer now because of our Christian faith, we will enter into glory and will be triumphant. The suffering is just for a short time, but the glory, the triumph, the happiness, the bliss will be forever. The two verses I've read to you, they're very clear. They're very simple. When you have the difficulty in the passage you are looking at today, it's the, the, the verses in between. Verses 19 through to 21 by which... Also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, its souls, were saved by water. Uh, you, you have difficulty there. In fact, there are commentaries that have difficulty. Some people, did they've been commenting on all the verses of First Peter. When they come into verses 19 and 20, they just uh, repeat uh, those uh, verses and say, that's what the Bible says, and then they move on. Uh, you are not able to really understand what it means. It went by the Spirit. And it went and prayed to the spirits in prison. What kind of prison? Where was that prison? Who were those spirits? Were they angelic? Were they human? They don't tell you. And then it says, it was at the time of Noah. When in the time of the long suffering of God, he was preparing the ark for so many years. At that time when eight souls were saved. And then there have been kind of false doctrines that have come out of those two verses. Some people have thought that there is a second chance that you see the people die now. And then if they have not gotten saved, then there's a second chance in the great beyond when they will have and when they will receive the privilege of uh, having the gospel preached unto them again. But it's not so. You'll find, it, you'll find out as we study the text itself. And then it talks about water baptism. It says, wherein its souls were saved, saved by water. How are they saved by water? You learn that. It says the like figure is an illustration, it's a symbol, it's a type, it's a picture. Whereunto even baptism does also save us now. Some people say, There you are. Immediately you pray to somebody in the bus in the street, or at the bus stop anywhere, you take them to the riverside immediately because they are saved by the water baptism. But they do not understand, neither do they read in depth or study the word of God. What the Lord is telling us here, in brackets, parenthesis, it says, not the putting away of the fields of the flesh, or about the water, but the answer of a good conscience. And then he, unto God, towards God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you need to understand that there are passages of scripture, that we need the Spirit of God, we need the teachers equipped by the Spirit of God himself to be able to explain. Because those difficult verses, the tendency and what people do is that they take those scriptures, they rest them, they twist them, they bend them to their own uh, perdition. That's exactly what we're told in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 16. Second Peter 3, 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood that's what we come to today some of those verses things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable they rest they twist they mutilate they destroy as they do also other scriptures not only the scriptures of paul but the scriptures of peter and the scriptures written uh, inspired uh, through these apostles unto their own destruction that's the reason why then as you come you need to pay attention as you study the word of god in fact that's what we're told we're supposed to do in second timothy chapter 2 second timothy chapter 2 i'm reading to you there in verse 15 it says study to show yourself show thyself approved unto god a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly properly dividing the word of truth 
rightly, properly dividing the word of truth. Why do you do that? Why would you study every part of scripture? And why would you endeavor and study and be very diligent in rightly dividing the scripture so that to yourself you'll be stable in the word of God in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14 that ends forth that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the sledge of men by the uh, uh, and uh, cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive the reason why we study the word of god and we do it in death is so that there will be no deception is so that uh, you will not be so unstable and you will not be carried about by every wind of doctrine you will be like the house that is built upon the rock and the wind will come and the flood will come and the rain will beat upon the house but the house will stand firm because we are solidly built on the study of the word of God come now to the passage we are looking at today and uh, you need to really pay attention uh, keep awake and don't sleep while we go through these important verses that will enrich our Christian lives we we'll divided the study into three parts number one the sacrificial atonement of Christ sacrificial atonement of christ number two the spirit's announcement before christ the spirit's announcement before christ and then number three is the supreme authority of christ number one the sacrificial atonement of christ in first peter chapter three reading there in verse 18 for christ also has once suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but quickened made alive resurrected by the spirit here we're told of the suffering of christ here we're told of what christ himself has done and we're told the reason why he did it it's talking about the atonement the death of christ a substitutionary death that is he did it in your place he did it in my place he did it in the place of all sinners the just for the unjust and they were told that christ so was just he had no sin he had not done anything wrong he suffered and he died for sinners that is for the people that are unjust it's the innocent dying for the guilty is a holy dying for the unholy is a righteous dying for the unrighteous is a perfect son of god dying for people that are guilty that are that should be punished that should that are polluted here in this world what we're sinful we're wicked and we're condemned before god but then christ he came as the lamb of god to take away the sin of the world and then it says he did it for a reason that he might bring god to god is this then was the only means by which sinners can be reconciled unto God. You understand? There has been a great gulf, a great chasm between the holy God and sinful men. And uh, we could not bridge that gap. But Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, he came. On the one hand, he held the hand of the holy God because he was holy and God is holy, as holy as God. On the other hand, he held our hand because he was made in the likeness of men. And therefore, as the Son of Man, he could identify with the sons of men. And he brought the hand of the holy God and the hand of the sinful man. He brought the hands together after his blood has been shed for us so that our sins will be cleansed and washed away christ then became the bridge through whom we can pass from our sinfulness unto god's righteousness unto the sight of the lord and through his grace and through his mercy and through his love all our guilt all our evil can now be cleansed away and taken away it is by the death of christ and the death of christ alone that sin bearing death that substitutionary death that atoning death that christ can be appeased that god can be appeased and then men can be reconciled unto god there is no other way and then he tells us over there that uh, the, the reason for that is for your good in fact the, the scriptures say the same thing all over look at uh, first peter chapter 2 from verse 21 or even even here unto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us. Christ suffered for us. It's a suffering that brings us salvation. It's that suffering that brings uh, uh, the regeneration, reconciliation with God. Then we're told in verse 24, who himself, who 
his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness that's the purpose that's the reason why he did what he did in fact that uh, thing about christ is substitutionary death it's kind of death will die the reason he will come to this world to die had been prophesied in many parts of the old testament a few of them in isaiah chapter 53 Isaiah chapter 53, there in verse 4, all through to verse 6, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I'm telling you tonight, if you have not given your life to Christ, if you are still under the bondage of sin, the load and the guilt and the condemnation of sin, if your sin is still weighing you down, if you are wondering where will you spend eternity of course if you do not give your life to christ where would you really spend eternity but if you want to be reconciled to god and you want uh, what christ has done to be beneficial unto you what you need to do is to come to christ and look at him because he died for you so that he can take your sin away and the moment you say yes lord i accept what you did on calvary was for me your sins will be forgiven the guilt will be taken away the burden the load of sin will be lifted from you and then you become free because if the son of man shall set you free the son of god setting you free you'll be free you'll be free indeed you say but i'm ungodly but i'm unrighteous yes nothing in your hand are you going to bring you come just as you are because it was while we were yet sinners ungodly that's the time christ came for us in romans chapter 5 verse 6 romans chapter 5 verse 6 it says there for when we were yet without strength in due time christ died for the ungodly you say you're ungodly yes god knows about that and it's because of that ungodliness in your life that's why jesus died it's while we were yet sinners that christ died for the ungodly in verse 7 for scarcely for a righteous man will one die yet peradventure for a good man some will even dare to die but god commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners christ died for the ungodly much more than being now justified by his blood not by your good works not by your religion not by anything you can do you just simply trust and believe and lean upon the lord being justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath from punishment from eternal perdition through him it says for eve when we were enemies we were reconciled to god by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life you understand then that the lord has made adequate provision for you and you do not need to bear the guilt and the punishment of your sin everything is laid on christ now you can come just as you are and freedom is waiting for you and uh, salvation is waiting for you the grace of god covers everything you have done once you are willing to come to the lord and believe on the lord hebrews chapter 9 verse 26 Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26 for then must see often have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world as he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself he has appeared once and as he has appeared he suffered on the cross and that single vicarious death substitutionary death is enough in the sight of god to take away all your sin to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself what does that mean in the old testament they laid the, they laid their hands on the sacrifice they were bringing to the lord and they will transfer all their sin all their evil all their iniquity on that lamb and then kill that lamb for that lamb to bear the punishment of death that they should have borne and now it's like you put your sins on christ because that's what the lord himself wants you to do he has laid on him the iniquity of us all and so we are told in verse 28 christ also so christ was once offered 
to bear the sins of many and unto them unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation you can come then and then the lord will forgive you he'll reconcile you unto himself by the sacrifice of the lord jesus christ is through that you can have the peace of god when your sins are pardoned your sins are taken away now there will be reconciliation and now there will be peace in your heart and peace in your life there will be a change of life too the lord will so change your life so transform you things will become totally different by the power of his grace ephesians chapter 2 ephesians chapter 2 reading from verse 13 it says but now in christ jesus ye who were sometimes far off are made near nigh by the blood of christ you've been far away because your sin separated you from the lord but now as uh, you believe on the lord jesus christ all your sins are taken away and you are made near by the lord and to the lord in verse 14 for he is our peace you need to have peace. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And then you are restless and without peace because there is no peace, says the Lord, to the wicked. But then as you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll find out he died for you. He stood in your place. He bore your punishment. Because of that, he is our peace. Who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us and has abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandment contained in ordinance sees for to make of himself in himself of twain one new man so making peace what it means there is that the jews as they were getting saved and the gentiles as they were getting saved they became one body in christ and there was no partition anymore no difference anymore they are united and joined together in one and that he might reconcile both jews and gentiles unto god in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby that is enmity between us and god god has taken that away because of the death of christ enmity between the jews and the gentiles god has taken that away to you by the death of christ enmity between tribe and tribe even though you belong to the same country the enmity that has been there when you believe on the lord jesus christ no enmity in the heart anymore no division anymore no discord anymore the blood of jesus cleanses everything away in verse 17 and came and preached peace to you that which were afar off and to them which were near that is the gentiles that were afar off the jews that were about uh, supposedly near a uh, spirit peace unto them for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the father uh, therefore then we understand as all have seen and come short of the glory of god the only solution uh, that we have been given for the removal of our sin the remission of our sin the forgiveness of our sin so that we can be reconciled unto god is the blood of jesus is a cleansing that comes through the purification regeneration in the shed blood of jesus christ and when you believe that when you accept that, when you appropriate that, when you take it for yourself, say, yes, it's for me. He died for me. If that fellow is saved, I can be saved to you. If the sins of that if you has been forgiven, my sins can be forgiven to you. I place my faith on the Lord. I lean entirely upon him. Not my works, not my good works, not anything that I've done, not anything that I can do, but what Christ has done for me already. It is that acceptance, that appropriation. It is that that brings the grace of God and salvation into your very life. It Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 from verse 23. For all have seen and come short of the glory of God being justified freely. You see that word? You need to underline that word freely. That is freely. There's nothing you come to pay. It's not by paying money in the church. It's not by burning candle in the church. It's not by wearing white garment or whatever it is. It's not by going barefooted. It's not by doing this and giving things to the beggar. Being justified freely. What does that mean justified? You are guilty before God. You are your way to eternal perdition. You are your way to hell because of the sins you have committed. And then you came and you were pleading before the Lord. You wanted forgiveness. You wanted the peace of God. You wanted the salvation of God. You wanted a new change, a new life. How could you have that except you are justified, except your guilt and condemnation will be taken away? 
How is that done? It is free by the grace, it says in verse 24, by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, that Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation is the, is the sacrifice for us, is the, is the thing that appeases God on our behalf through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission, removal, forgiveness, pardon of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And in verse 26 is to declare, I say, at this time is righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. The moment you come and say, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. The Lamb of God has died. And he died for me to take away my sin. At that very moment, your faith will take hold of the mercy of God. And then your sins are forgiven. Your life is changed. Your name is written in the book of life. You become a member of the family of God and then you begin the journey on your way to heaven. In Titus chapter 2, reading there from verse 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Come back to your first Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. We're looking at this verse 18 before we move on to point number 2. Here we find uh, Peter talking about the, the suffering of Christ. And he gives us three things about the suffering of Christ. Look at it. For Christ also as one suffered for sin. Number one, the pain of Christ's suffering. It was painful. Some people feel because it was Christ that the sin will not be painful. Oh yes, it was painful. He knew how bitter the cup will be. That's why I went to get sea money. And that's why he prayed, if this cup will not pass over me, uh, then thy will be done. And you remember on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The pain of Christ's suffering. And then it says, the just for the unjust, the paradox of Christ's suffering. And normally, a righteous people should not suffer. Just people should not suffer. Perfect people should not suffer. The perfect Son of God, nobody ever convicted him of sin. Who of you convinces me of sin? He said. And yet, the paradox of it all is that he still suffered, even though he was just. Why did he do that? Because he was suffering for the unjust. And then, the purpose of Christ's suffering, it says that he might bring us to God. That's the purpose. That's the bottom line. That's why the Lord did what he did. And if you are coming to church, or if you are reading the Bible, or if you claim to be in the Christian religion, and that purpose has not been fulfilled, then you are not really in it yet. You are on the outskirts of the Christian faith. The purpose why Christ came is that he will bring us to God. The pain, the paradox, the purpose. Then it says that being put to death in the flesh, that and but uh, quickened by the spirit. Uh, that means he rose from the dead. He died and he was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead, quickened and made alive by divine power. That resurrection of Jesus Christ is a fact and it was for our justification. His atonement and sacrifice was acceptable in the sight of the Father. Divine Divine justice has not been satisfied. Any sinner who believes in his atoning death and the resurrection of Christ can now be pardoned and salvation cannot be yours because Christ has risen from the dead. Now we go to point number two. The Spirit's announcement before Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 3, reading there in verses 19 and 20, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, we sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, its souls were saved by water. Many people find this uh, verse very difficult to understand for them. And, they, and many people have capitalized on these two verses and they have preached their doctrine of a second chance. What they mean by that is that now you have your chance in the life you are living now to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and prepare for heaven. And then they say, should in case you miss it, then you die. After you have died, then there is a second chance while you are on the other side because after all it says that Christ went and he preached to the spirits in prison who many years 
before were disobedient in the days of Noah. They had a second chance. Why shouldn't you have a second chance? That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what it's saying here. The reason why they do not understand is that they do not look at all the punctuation marks that are here. If you go back to the latter part of verse 18, it says, quickened by the Spirit. He doesn't put a full stop. And then he continues in verse 19, by which, by that Spirit, he went and proclaimed unto the spirits in prison. What it means is, long ago when those people were living, the spirit of God was inside a Noah. And that spirit of God that God said, my spirit will not always strive with men. He was preaching to them. And it was the spirit of Christ helping him to preach the word unto them so that they could be saved. But they didn't get saved, therefore they died. When they died, their spirit became separate from uh, their body and their spirits now went into prison the preaching is not while they're in prison now when they were still alive the proclamation the preaching was made unto them because they rejected they are now in prison uh, let me clear it up for you when it says spirits you need to understand that it's when after somebody has died if the lord is referring to that person before the resurrection day it's referred to a spirit look at acts chapter 7 reading from verse 59 acts 7 59 and the stone stephen calling upon god saying lord jesus receive my spirit receive my spirit it means then his body was here after he died for the believers to go and bury the body and the thing that went over there was the spirit in, in uh, hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12, there in verse 23. You will say, it says to the general assembly, to the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. The people that were believers when they went up there, it, their body has not been erased from the dead yet. Uh, it's their spirit that is there in the sight of the Lord. In fact, it's the same thing we're told in the Old Testament. In Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 in verse 7 then shall the dust return to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return unto god who gave it so then when uh, people die their spirits will go to the great beyond if they were believers and they were righteous their spirits will go to the sight of the lord if they are not uh, righteous then uh, they, they will go and uh, their spirit will go to hell and uh, now when it says that by the spirit he had preached to those people in the days of noah uh, you understand the way peter is talking peter believed that all those people of the old testament they had the spirit of christ and the word they were preaching they were preaching it by the spirit of christ he said it already in uh, chapter 1 verse 11 uh, chapter 1 of first peter verse 11 searching what or what manner of time the spirit of christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the suffering of christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the holy ghost sent down from heaven with things the angels desire to look into here peter said that in the old testament those old testament Testament, uh, patriarchs and prophets and priests they were preaching the word by what spirit were they preaching the word is by the spirit of christ even before christ came into this world they had the spirit of christ in them and it was by that spirit of christ they testified beforehand the sufferings of christ and peter repeats himself in another way in a uh, first peter chapter 4 First Peter chapter 4, in verse 6, it tells us that uh, he preached the word to them at that time. First Peter 4, 6, for, for this cause was the gospel preached also unto them that are dead. He said, when they were still alive, the gospel was preached unto them. But now they are no more here on earth, they are now 
dead. It says that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Which means then very clearly, Paul, uh, Peter was emphasizing the fact, all those people that lived at the time of Noah, they had the privilege of hearing the word of God. By the spirit of Christ, the gospel was proclaimed unto them. Because they didn't believe, that is the reason why their spirits are now in prison. In uh, Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, reading there from verse 2. To understand that it's not only the New Testament people that have the gospel preached unto them. Uh, the people in the Old Testament, they had the uh, gospel preached unto them as well. By the Spirit of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. That is, those of us living now in the New Testament age, the gospel has been preached unto us. But then it's the same thing for the people in the Old Testament Old Covenant, the gospel was preached unto them too. But the word preached did not profit them. Those people in the days of Noah and the people that lived at the time of Noah, eh, the word did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. When Noah was telling them the flood was coming, judgment was coming and he was uh, preaching the word a preacher of righteousness uh, the bible calls uh, noah he was preaching to them by the spirit of god that word did not profit them because it did not mix with faith in them how will the flood come how will God destroy the whole earth? However violent and wicked we are, how will he just obliterate and destroy, extinguish everything? No, it cannot be the same. They add the word by the preaching of Noah through the Spirit of God. In, in Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9, reading there in verse 30. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 30, yet many years didst thou forbear them and testified against them by thy spirit in thy prophet yet they would not hear therefore givest thou them into the hand of the people of the land it's very clear then that uh, those people of the they will call them the anti-deluvian people that is before the deluge before the flood came upon them they had the privilege of hearing the gospel but they did not believe because of that when they died and they perished in that flood uh, their body was there on earth but their spirits went into prison went into into the place of punishment that is into hell in Gen genesis chapter 6 genesis chapter 6 verse 3 and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, and yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. The Lord said, I'm going to be patient with them. I'm going to allow Noah to be preaching unto them these uh, many years, but it will not be forever. My spirit shall not always strive with man. When Noah was preaching by the spirit of Christ in him, it was the spirit of God bringing conviction on them striving with them, telling them repent. It's not going to be like you are thinking. Judgment is going to come. Don't be careless with your life. Don't gamble with your life and don't throw away your soul. Then it says in verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In verse 13, and God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them and behold, I I will destroy them with the earth. You should understand now from all those scriptures that we have read that uh, at that time uh, Noah was preaching unto them, but they didn't accept. That's the reason why they perished. Uh, because uh, you must understand that Noah was not just building the ark. He was building the ark. At the same time, he was preaching the word unto them. In Second Peter chapter 2 verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. He was a preacher of righteousness. And because they didn't repent, they didn't give their lives to the Lord, they didn't turn away from their evil ways, that's why they eventually perished. First Peter chapter 3 verses 19 and 20 see if you now understand in the latter part of verse 18 quickened by the spirit by that spirit also he went and preached unto them when they were still alive they didn't repent therefore they died 
uh, they are now spirits in prison. That is, they are now caged, they are now confined, and they are now put into the place of punishment, which sometimes they were disobedient. Formerly, they were disobedient. When once the suffering, the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, and he was preaching to them, uh, wherein a few that he said so, and Noah himself included, was saved by water. We now come to point number three, is the supreme authority of Christ. The supreme authority of Christ. He, now he mentions, uh, he mentions water. And he mentions the flood. He mentions the ark. And you need to understand here, because it says in verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism whereunto even baptism does now also save us omit uh, the, the the parenthesis there that's the what's in bracket it says by the resurrection of jesus i'm showing you how to understand some difficult passages you see if you read everything together i'll just say uh, the like figure whereunto even baptism does now save us not the putting away of the fields of the flesh but the answer of a good uh, conscience toward god by the resurrection of jesus christ as you read everything together like that, you may have difficulty understanding. You understand that the bracket is put there to make explanation of what the writer was saying. So to start with, omit the bracket. And then just say, uh, reading from verse uh, 20, saved by water, the like figure, the like picture, the like symbol, the like illustration, Whereunto even baptism does now only save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then he explains what he's talking about. He's not talking about the literal dipping you into the water. You come back to the bracket. Not the putting away of the fields of the flesh. As if the dipping you into the water is a thing that saves you. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now he calls it a figure. An illustration. And then you throw your mind back. How were they saved by the water? Understand? It's not because they were immersed in the water that they were in fact. The people that were immersed inside the water, they were lost. Only the people that were inside the ark, those were the people that were saved. If he meant that uh, the people that are immersed in water at the, at the baptism are the people that are saved, then uh, how about those people? All of them immersed inside the water. They never came out. They were the people that were lost. But the people that were inside the ark, they were the people that were saved. What Peter is saying is this, Christ is the ark. You come into Christ the ark. The deluge, the water of judgment pours upon the ark. And uh, all those people that were inside the ark, the water could not reach them. The water of judgment and the water and the flood of judgment was only beating upon the ark and only bore up the ark. And the people inside the ark were protected, preserved, and saved. Which means then, those of us in Christ, the judgment of God, that is the deluge, that is the flood of judgment, the wrath of God pours upon Christ. It's a figure. It's just an illustration. And as it pours on Christ, and we are in Christ, then we are saved. Then we say, see, Christ has borne my punishment. The thing I should bear, he has borne. And because I was in Christ, that's why the deluge of the judgment of water did not reach me. I am identified with Christ. We we'll say, are you identified with Christ? We we'll say, yes. Uh, what did Christ do? Christ died. He was buried. He rose again. If you are identified with Christ, there is something you are going to do now. Demonstrate that identification. Then you go into the water, identify with the ark, identified with Christ, and then you come up the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So then you understand, it's giving us an illustration. Those who are inside the ark are the people that
that are saved, those who are in Christ are the people that are saved. A water baptism is very important, but it is not the ceremony, it is not the rite, it is not the dipping into the water that saves you, it is your identification with Christ and coming into Christ, believing in Christ that actually saves you. And then the water baptism is identification, a picture, an illustration, a type of a symbol of identification with him. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You believe, you come into Christ. And if you are in Christ, or a new creature in Christ, all things pass away, all things become a new in your life. And it is that being in Christ, being in the ark, that makes you to avoid and to escape the judgment that comes by the flood, by the water. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter Chapter 6, reading there from verse 3. Here it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Total identification with him that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the resurrection of the, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. So then it is very clear what the Lord has done. We have been saved because of what Christ has done. But then in First Peter chapter 3, reading there in verse 22, still in verse 21, in the bracket now, it says, Not the putting away of the fields of the flesh. That is what's important. It's not just the literal thing, the dipping into the water, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. You have confessed your sins to the Lord before that water baptism and you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ before that water baptism. You have accepted the grace of God, the pardon of God, and then the, the sin has been taken away. The guilt is no more there. There is a good conscience. In fact, a good conscience now, you have also started making your restitution, you have a free conscience, a good conscience, a clear, clean conscience toward God and toward man. And all that has been accomplished by the resurrecting power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ, where is he now? He's in heaven. He started, he started the story by telling us of his suffering. Now he's going to tell us the consummation, the climax of the whole thing, which is that he is now gone into heaven in verse 22, and is by in the, on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being subject unto him. Here he tells us uh, something uh, very clear and we again uh, look at uh, this section now. Number one, there is a picture of Christ's suffering. The picture of Christ's suffering. That is Christ uh, represented, symbolized, typified by the ark. The judgment came upon the ark and therefore that saved and secured and preserved the people inside the ark. The same thing is a picture of Christ's suffering. The judgment has come upon him and your punishment has been laid upon him because you are in him. That is why you are now preserved. Number two is purity through Christ's suffering. It is through that we now have a good conscience, a clear conscience. It's taking our sins away. Our sins are now totally forgiven. Everything is now alright in the sight of the Lord. And then number three, he has a preeminence after Christ suffering. After he suffered, he now came into prominence and preeminence because angels and powers and authorities, they are now totally submissive and they're subjected unto him. And he's now gone into the right hand of God. He's uh, no more like uh, when he was here in his humiliation. There's no humiliation anymore now. The time of humiliation was a time of suffering. But now he's uh, exalted by the right hand of the Father. In Mark chapter 16 verse 9. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and he sat on the right hand 
of God. And that's under the first message that uh, Peter preached uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He emphasized that too, that Christ has moved away from uh, humiliation to glorification. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, reading from verse 34. Acts chapter 2, verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but said, but he says himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, seed thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ, is now exalted and is the head of all things to the church. And it is by him now that God the Father upholds all things. In Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, reading there in verse 3, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, talking about the exaltation of Christ, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. In First Corinthians chapter 15, First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 and 25. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under feet. You, you've seen what we have looked at today. We have uh, looked at the suffering of Christ and the supremacy of Christ. You say, what are you going to take home from all this? The point is, Peter has been emphasizing that Christians do suffer too. And in the suffering of the Christian, he ought to understand that Christ also suffered for him. And we are now following him after the example and the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, in your suffering, here are things that you ought to take note of. First Peter chapter 3. Reading in verse 17, for it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well doing uh, than for evil doing. All through your suffering, let there be number one purity while suffering. That it will be for well doing. It will not be like because you have sinned, because you have done evil. Let it be pure persecution, not punishment. Persecution. You are living right. You are a child of God. You are living the new life. And as a result of that, those who do not agree with your conviction, they persecute you. Purity uh, uh, while uh, suffering. And then it says in the middle of verse 18, that he might bring us to God. That means then there should be the purpose for your suffering. It must be to bring other people to the Lord. When they watch you are you are suffering, when they watch you are you are, are, you are facing persecution, they said there must be something real in what this woman is standing for, what this lady is standing for, what this man is standing for because if it were not real, why would he be suffering like this? That's what Joseph said. He said, I don't think you have sent me here. God has a purpose in this to preserve a posterity for you. There should be purpose in our suffering. And then you remember he tells us about Noah and you know that the, the jeering, the, the jesting and the ridicule that will be on Noah, how they'll be making caricature of uh, Noah, making fun of him. Uh-huh. Uh, the father of rain, the father of the flood. He says a flood is coming. Uh, this one is coming. Every time they saw him, they might be pointing to the sky or they might be pointing to rain or whatever it is that this will happen and that will happen. And yet it says he kept on preaching. What do you understand then? In the midst of your prayer, of your suffering, in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of all the things you might be going through, preaching while suffering. The suffering is there but you keep on preaching. That's why we love what we learn to you from the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we learn from uh, people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and all the people that have suffered for their faith. There is preaching that is going on all through the time of suffering and then we're told eventually 
there's promotion after suffering. You suffered for a while, and then there is promotion after that. It means that if you do not give up, if you do not bend in, cave in, give in to the enemy, and then stop your conviction, it means that the promotion will come eventually. Uh, there is uh, the purity you maintain, there is the purpose of your suffering, and there is the preaching, the performance that goes on. While you are suffering, then there is uh, the perfection, there is the promotion. In First Peter chapter 5, First Peter chapter 5, I'm reading there from verse 10, but the God of all grace, the God of all grace, that is the grace that saves, and the grace that sanctifies, and the grace that purifies, and the grace that is sufficient for you in all your trials, everything you may be going through, the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while it's just for a while it's your light uh, tribulation your light persecution your light trial your light affliction that you have here and it's just for a moment it says after ye have suffered for a while make you perfect establish strengthen and settle you which means if you will not uh, give up if you will not uh, relent your effort and you keep on serving the lord in the midst of the trial trouble and tribulation and suffering there is the promotion after the whole thing you rise up and talk to the lord in prayer and you will tell the lord uh, if you have not suffered for your christian faith you must question what that kind of christian faith that you have but if you are suffering for the christian faith and understand purity must go along while you're suffering for that christian faith not only that your preaching performance of a christian duty christian responsibility it must go on while you are suffering persecution not only that there is a purpose of suffering what's the purpose why are you suffering what's the purpose in your own life let the purpose be fulfilled and then if you wait and you are patient with the lord there will be the promotion eventually through the suffering after the suffering open your mouth and talk to the lord thank God for helping you to understand the word of God and what we have learned today and apply it to your life let the Lord himself write it upon the tables of your heart suffering is there, more suffering may still come, but I say purpose to it let the purpose of the Lord be fulfilled